can't enter the kingdom. It's a good reason why, right? Sin can't enter heaven, right? We have to be pure, as that young man was. I don't know what condemn means. Do we know what condemn means, church? We do, right? These little ones, they don't, they don't. It's, it's good. Uh, man, this is just such great. You teach a lesson. on. They teach us every, every Sunday morning, right? More than we can learn in Bible class in those five minutes. So we're studying Grace Simply Incredible, Incredibly Simple by Dan Winkler. We're in a section that we're discussing the taste of grace. And in this section, Dan is talking about what, what well, he's, he's visualizing to us through, through food, like last week, and he's talking about what's important um, with grace. And last week, do you remember what we, what we talked about? That we should deeply appreciate as it relates to grace. What were we given? What have we been given? New life. Well, we've been given a new life, but what did we talk about last week? By grace, what, what have we been given? Okay, y'all are all right, but y'all are making me feel bad about what I taught last week. <laughs> Let me give you a hint. What have we been given, class? We've been given God's Word. We've been given the Old Testament and the New Testament. Maybe this will make me feel better. Why? What does the Old Testament do for us? It prepares us for who? Starts with a J, ends with a... <laughs> what does the New Testament prepare us? What, how does it prepare us? To live with. Starts with a J, ends with a... So we've been given, by grace, we've been given the Word of God, given the Old Testament to prepare us for. It was given, we were given the Old Testament to prepare us for Jesus coming. And then we've been given the New Testament to prepare us to live with Jesus. This week we're going to be discussing the second taste of grace, and that is our relationship with Jesus and the many ways our lives are blessed through that relationship. 1 Corinthians 15.10 says what? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Brother Jeff, that's the one thing we'll learn out of this class, the verse. Jeff always says a Bible teacher should should at least come out of class that the class knows one thing. So you may not know what we studied last week, but you know our memory verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. This morning, of all the blessings that accompany our relationship with Jesus, what sticks out to you? With your relationship with Jesus, when you become a child of God, what are you most thankful for? Give me some. Forgiveness. You're very thankful for forgiveness. Mercy and grace. Mercy and grace. Salvation. Salvation. What else? Love. Love. We're, we're loved and shouldn't be, right? We don't deserve that. We don't deserve mercy and grace. Don't deserve forgiveness. What else? Hope. Say it again. Hope. 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 Didn't have hope without Jesus, right? We were lost. What else? Missing two or three that I, I've got. Prayer. Prayer. We had, we had some discussion on prayer this weekend. And, you know, do we, um, do we pray enough? It's probably the most underutilized tool we have, Miss Geraldine, that 
is there, is there a limit on when we can pray? Did God say, only pray to me in the morning when you wake up? And, and the... I was thinking, as I was going through this lesson, you know, with prayer, um, I'll underutilize it when I think I've got everything under control. I don't pray enough when everything's good. It was said, and y'all have heard it, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if everything's going good for you right now, be ready. You're fixing to go into a trial because you're either, and we've talked about this before, you're either going into a trial, you're in a trial, or what? You're coming out of one. So if you're not in one right now, you better be praying. You better not think you've arrived. You better not think you've got this world figured it out because you're, you are about to go into a trial. If you're coming out of a trial, you better be thankful that you've, you're coming out of one, right? Prayer, we, we don't utilize it enough. One of my favorites, and, and it sticks with me, and I think about it, and if, if you've ever heard me pray, I, this is the thing that's usually always in my prayer, is thank you for your patience and long-suffering. Because if, if God didn't have patience, um, if Larry and June Killen didn't have patience, I'd have left this world quicker than I come into it. But I, if God didn't have patience with me, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you and I'd be lost. If our God was impatient, he would have, he would have took me out many years ago. And, and that blessing sticks with me that I'm so thankful our God has more patience than I do. Um, peace was one of the things I think it was mentioned in our lesson. If it wasn't, I, I wrote it down. Is it, is it a blessing to have peace? Does the world have peace? We throw peace around, world peace. We need to be at peace with each other, but does people that don't have Christ really and truly have peace? They should worry more than we, we do. I know we worry about things during the week, about work, but the people of the world, they should see that we have peace about us, that our hope is not a, of this world. Jesus was able to endure the cross because of the joy that was set before him. Hebrews 12, 2. Someone get that? Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <coughs> Does that make sense to us, Cheryl? We know all of his pain. We're going to commemorate his suffering in a little bit. All that pain that we know Christ went through, all the ridicule, all the scorning, does that really make sense that he would have joy? Would we have joy out of that? Why did, why, why did he have joy? Because he was going... Okay. Other thoughts? He what? Did he know if he didn't do it, what would happen to us? So Johnny said he, he had joy through all that pain because he knew what he was doing it for. He knew who he was doing it for. He knew why he was doing it. To please God, that was one. But he knew that the cross was going to save us. Today we're going to, this the video we'll watch, Jesus, Blessed Jesus. If y'all, Chris, you got it? It's, it's, okay, number eight. He's going to talk about He's going to describe it again or relate it to food and the ta our subject matter, taste of grace. Jesus being the main dish and then as a main dish, 
the side dishes, what those side dishes are. And he says, main dish, a relationship with Jesus, side items, a friend in heaven. school, each year we were given entree options for our football banquet, and they were always exceptional. Not your everyday PBJ, deli slices, or a scoop of tuna fish over lettuce. It wasn't fried chicken with rice and gravy and peas. It wasn't pork chops, okra, or a good mess of turnip greens. You can tell, I guess, that I'm from the South. No, the banquet options were extraordinarily special. Chicken cordon bleu, roast beef, tenderloin smothered in its own juices. For your sides, you could choose something like yam casserole, baked potato, slightly crisp snap peas, carrots, and well, you get the idea. When it comes to what we're calling the feast of God's favor, grace, there are no options. God only offers us one entree, and he has handpicked the side items that go with it. I want you to think with me about the main dish on God's banquet table of grace and the side items that go with it. The meal has been planned, prepared, and it's steaming hot ready. We just need to have an appetite and the desire to accept God's invitation to come to the feast of his favor. Remember the beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Matthew 5, 6. Are you hungry? Thirsty? Do you really want to be right with God, righteous? Then think with me about the feast that makes God's favor possible. Let's start by looking at the main dish of this meal. It's not a rack of ribs right off the grill. It's not a double-decker hamburger with tomato and onions or tacos or chicken spaghetti. The one and only main dish in the Feast of God's favor is a relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord. And folks, that ought to be enough. Have you ever taken the time to let your mind soak up the wonder of the one called Jesus? Just listen to those closest to the Lord. What every member of the Godhead said. God the Father said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, 17. God the Holy Spirit spoke through Peter and said, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. Acts 2, 36. He's the Son of God. He was made Lord and Christ by God. Jesus is the divine Master and Messiah of all mankind, and God's grace offers us a relationship with Him. That's just amazing. Listen to those who worked around Jesus. For example, there's his kinsman and co-worker, John the Baptizer. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1.29. Our Lord's apostles were just as expressive. Andrew said of Jesus, We have found the Messiah, John 1.41. Philip said, We have found the one that Moses and all the prophets wrote about, John 1.45. Nathaniel, probably Bartholomew, was a little more skeptical at first, but he ended up being the most dramatic in his description of Jesus. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. John 1, 49. Listen to what Jesus said himself. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. He's the secret to ultimate satisfaction. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, he said, John 8, 12. He gives us direction for daily living. I'm the door of the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, John 10, 7 to 11. He offers us the protection of his wise care. I'm the resurrection and the life, he said. 
He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. John eleven twenty five. He gives us the hope of a bodily resurrection. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. He provides us with a connection to God. Ah, the wonder of one called Jesus. And we get to enjoy a special relationship with Him if we are blessed to sit at the table of God's grace. There are a multitude of blessings or side items that garnish this fellowship. Here are just three, all found in the New Testament book of Hebrews. First, with Jesus, we have someone in heaven that can talk to God about our temptations. Hebrews 2.19, For in that he himself, Jesus, has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. How about that? When the devil tries to seduce us away from God with our own desires, Jesus understands and can solicit God's help. I know what that's like. Let's not let that go any further. That's just mighty encouraging to me. Second, with Jesus, we have someone in heaven that can talk to God about our troubles. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. We have a great high priest, don't miss that word great, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. And he sympathizes with us and invites us to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Third, with Jesus, we have someone in heaven that can talk to God about our transgressions. Hebrews 9, 24, Christ has entered into heaven itself. Watch, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. That's in the chapter that talks about blood, the blood of Jesus and forgiveness more than any other chapter in the New Testament. When we need forgiveness, the one who died to make our forgiveness possible. The one who's, who has scars in his hands, in his feet, in his side, is sitting right next to God's side, helping us, keeping us in God's favor. When we come to the banquet table of God's grace, we find a wonderful relationship with Jesus. And with Jesus, we have an advocate with the Father, 1 John 2, verse 1. We have someone ready and willing to talk to God about our struggles, our sadness, and our sin. There's just no one like Jesus, and no life compares to a life with Jesus. It's the one that allows us to quote our memory verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, and say with Paul, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And when you sit down and really think about what all that involves, well, it's just simply incredible. So thoughts, thoughts about Dan's comments about his uh, about the main dish, about the side dishes. What's the what's the main side dishes? Three T's, just just three. Temptation, Hebrews two nineteen. Because Jesus was tempted, he can what? He can understand, He can help us, He can aid us when, when we're tempted, right? What's the, what's the second? Second T. Second T. Troubles. Troubles. So we have a high priest, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, we have a high priest that can, when we're, when we're in trouble, He can sympathize with us. We talked about that um, with his mercy and love and grace. He, with mercy, he can feel as we feel, right? He can sympathize when we hurt, when we lose a loved one and, and are just in pain. 
We have a high priest that understands that, right? Jesus wept. Why did he weep? Do we know? It was about Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. He wept. There's some. That's kind of a trick question. There's not. We don't. Were you going to say something, John? He had compassion. That's that's a that's a good word to summarize it. Is it good that we have a high priest that has compassion? He sympathizes with us when we lose somebody. When we have when we to repentance and we have godly sorrow and we hurt Jesus understands he sympathizes with us he has hurt before as we have number three third transgressions, transgressions. He, appear, he appears to God he said someone said a while ago that he was beside the throne of God does it make you feel any better that when you pray to God, you've got a high priest that's right there with God saying, I understand, Father. I was tempted like them. Are you thankful for that? Are you thankful that we have a relationship with the high priest that's sitting by the throne of God? Let's turn, someone turn to John 1.17 and then 2 Corinthians 8.9. John 1.17 and 2 Corinthians 8.9. Get, get, be prepared to read that in just a minute. One of our study harder questions says, When Jesus was born, he was full of grace. What three titles did an angel give to Jesus when announcing his birth? If you read that in Luke chapter 2, 9 through 14, what was the three titles? What was one of them? Savior. Savior. This relates to his purpose. His purpose to come was to save us, to save the world, to save his children, to save the Father's children. Number two, what's the second one? Christ. This relates to his position. Christ meaning what? What what does the word Christ mean? Anointed. Anointed. So he was referred to as Savior, Christ, and then what was the last one? Lord. Lord meaning his authority, right? Right? Savior, his position as Christ anointed, and then he was called Lord, representing his power of authority. All right, who has John 1, 17? I heard Bibles turning. I know somebody turned to it. Okay. And then 2 Corinthians, so the law was given to Moses, grace and truth, through? Through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you though through his poverty might become rich. Okay. So Jesus Christ left his home in heaven. Come to earth bringing grace to who? To us. What did he leave? What do you think he left? He left everything. Yes, that's right. He left what? He he left in heaven. What did he leave in heaven? You're 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 right. Oh, okay. What did he leave in heaven? What did he give up? Maybe that's a better way to say it. All of, who said that? There's no way you talk that soft. All of his riches, that's right. Barbara said 
Aunt Barbara, I, I can give her a title, Aunt Barbara. He left all of his riches. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Someone get that. What does that mean, all of his riches? She's right. What do you think that means? We need to get a good grasp to, to understand what Jesus gave up. We ne- to come to us, we need to understand what he had. What does, it, what does that mean? That he give up his equality with God? We read that, Noel. He took a subservient position. He did. When, when we feel law, good job, so we should look at that, right? You ain't did nothing. When we get outside of our box and we serve somebody, we take some time out of our day. We could have been doing something that we wanted to do, and we think, man, we did a good job today. No, you didn't. <laughs> Humble yourself, because what did, what did Christ do? He was right with God, and he gave that up and become, to come to earth, right? What else? Or who, who has that verse? Who, who had that verse? Philippians Two, five through eight. We can look at that, right? When we serve, what comes with serving? Humility, right? It's not look at what I've done. He humbled himself and become a servant. So he give up. That's the biggest thing, right? But he give up the riches and he become poor. What does that mean when he become poor? Oh, there's and and what what connection did he have on earth? That's a, how did he communicate with the Father? Prayer, prayer. I don't think he ever looked like we do, right? He, I know he didn't. I shouldn't say that's just a phrase there. I know he didn't ever look it. It was, it was right opposite of what everybody was expecting to come, right? I mean, people were expecting an earthly king and, and to run, you know, he tore the, he 
flip the world upside down with the thought process. Why did, why did he do it? So we give all this up. Why did he do it? Because he loved us. Did we become rich? Spiritually speaking, were we poor? Did we have nothing? No hope? Nothing? He had the riches become poor. So we, poor spiritually, can become rich. Think about that. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings that graciously accompany our relationship with Jesus. One of those is forgiveness and peace that we enjoy knowing that we have been invited back into God's favor. What points of time are positively touched by our being justified? Justified never sinned. So think about time and what, po what points in your life have been touched by grace, by Jesus leaving heaven and coming. What points of your life? Forgiveness, okay. What, what points of your life, in your lifespan, what points have been touched by this grace? I'm a bad, bad teacher. The past, thanks, Sonia. The past, Sonia helps us there a little bit. So the past, is that all that's helped us? What other points in time? Huh? The present, the past, the present. We're on a roll. And the future. So, so if you put all those together, when, do, when, does, when does this help us? All the time, right? Because his, his every day, because his mercy, his grace, forgive us, Miss Lee. Well, I think you said it first. Forgiveness, right? Forgiveness of our past when we become a child of his through the washing the water of baptism, when we're immersed. The past, we're forgiven of our sins. The present. When we ask for forgiveness, right? And then what does it do in the future? Christ's blood does what? Continually cleanses us. When we what? When we walk in what? In the light. Hey, it just takes a little bit of pride and we get there. Very good. Thank you for your comments. Thanks for bailing me out. Sorry.